Hey there, welcome to Someone's Gotta Make It. On this show, we're talking to the founders and leaders behind businesses that make ordinary, everyday products we encounter all the time in our daily lives, but we never really think about where they come from. And what I've learned from talking to some of these folks is that they've gone through the same exact challenges in building their businesses as you've gone through if you're building a business of your own. So if you need some practical ways of overcoming the challenges that are plaguing you in your business right now, you're going to want to listen up. I'm your host, Ben Goldstein. I'm the VP of Marketing at Nutshell. Nutshell is a CRM and email marketing platform. We help thousands of businesses all over the world get organized and automate the little stuff in their day so they can focus on what really matters, which is building stronger relationships with your buyers. In this episode, we're talking about something I think we all use, bed sheets. And who better to walk us through the business of bed sheets than Janet Wishnia? Janet is the owner and managing partner of Thomaston Mills, as well as one of the owners and founders of American Blossom Linens, and bed sheets are in her blood. Janet's grandfather started the family's first linens business, this was way back in 1931. Janet took over as CEO in 2003, and a few years ago, she decided to launch a direct-to-consumer, or DTC, offshoot called American Blossom Linens. Uh, they offer high-quality luxury bedding made in the USA, but running a DTC business in the 21st century came with a pretty steep learning curve. And as Janet was getting her new business off the ground, she was suddenly faced with everything she didn't know about selling in the modern era. So Janet's here. She's going to tell us about the challenges of keeping up with modern business tactics to stay competitive. Uh, she's going to talk about what she had to learn to transition from the B2B world to the B2C world. And she's also going to tell us why thread counts are a total scam. That part blew my mind. So here's my conversation with Janet Wishnia of American Blossom Linens. Enjoy. Hey, Janet, thanks for being here. Oh, thank you, Ben, for inviting me. It's a pleasure. Let's start at the very beginning. What's your earliest memory of working in the family business? Actually, that's a really easy question. When I was about four or five years old, my father was the CEO of the company at the time, and he used to come home every night. He was a really hard worker, and he would have papers, and he would be sitting in front of the TV, and he'd be looking at his papers. You know, they were a small company then, and he often would have letters or bills or things to put in envelopes. So he would fold them up, and he would give them to me and give me the envelopes, and I would put the things in the envelopes as we were sitting there together watching TV. That's the first memory. So kind of a, a secretarial function at an early age. <laughs> yes. It was definitely like four or five. Wow. So... <laughs> What was the career path that you initially wanted to take as, an, as a young adult? I went to college and majored in anthropology. Actually, I went to University mm -hmm. of Pennsylvania, and I majored in anthropology. And I actually wanted to be a researcher and a professor at the time. Like every good teenage girl, my father kept telling me, you're really good at business, you have mm -hmm. a talent for it, you're good with people, you're good with numbers. You should take business courses. And of course, I did the opposite. So when I got to my senior year in college, it started to occur to me that it was going to be quite difficult to get a job on an archaeological dig or to make any money that way. And I also had a boyfriend at the time in Philadelphia who is now my husband. And I really didn't want to be traveling all over the world at that time. So my boyfriend said to me, you know, Janet, you're really good at business. You have a head for this. You should give it a try. And so because he said it, I decided to join the family business. <laughs> he is now my husband of this year, 40 years. Well, that's a very so, sweet story. Well, yeah. You know, you mentioned that, you know, your, your parents said, oh, you should go into business. You have a head for it. Was there an expectation or any pressure that you devote your career to the family business? There was a bit, yeah. It was my father and his two brothers. And other than their families, this was their life. They loved it. And they wanted the rest of us to be part of it. They weren't being mean. When they tried to push us, they did it because they loved it so much and they thought it was a good opportunity. In layman's terms, how is a bedsheet made? Well, first, uh, you grow the cotton in the field. Mm -hmm. 
And then you send it to a company that cleans the cotton called the gin. And then the gin sends it to the spinner who makes the yarn. You've probably seen photographs or little videos of people spinning. It's a machine and they twist the yarn. And the spinner sends it to a weaver. So they weave the fabric. Then the weaver sends it to the bleachery or the dye house where they, if you know, you want to make it a color, they dye it a color. We have two colors, white and natural. Then it's sent to a plant where they sew it. They cut it and sew it. There's a lot of steps. And then you have to sell it. And then you have to sell it. The hardest step of all. So your grandfather founded the original company about 90 years ago. What kinds of customers were you selling to back in the 1930s, and and how much has that changed over time? The company started as a retail store. When I was probably about three or four, Mm -hmm. my father and his brothers decided they didn't like the retail business. It was too many hours. You know, they had to work basically seven days a week, and they were married, they had young families, and they didn't really want to work seven days a week. So they brainstormed for a couple of months and decided they wanted to start selling to the government market and to the institutional market. So instead of selling to the end consumer, they would sell B2B. Government market being military, or what does that mean? They own hospitals, nursing homes, prisons. There's a lot of government-run facilities that use betting. And they started quoting on these government contracts. They also sold to hospitals, to ship chandlers, the people that furnish ships, places like that. They ended up growing that part of the business over the years so much that they closed their retail stores and just mm-hmm. became a B2B company. And today, is it the same kind of contract, same kinds of customers with, with the B2B side of the business? Pretty much, yes. Yeah. So that grew over time. So at that time... They were not manufacturing. They were strictly distributing. They were buying from other manufacturers and they were reselling it to these customers. But over time, we started to sell more and more bedsheets. And at one point, we decided it it made sense to make our own brand. So we actually, we got contractors to make them for us. And we kept growing and selling more and selling more. And we outgrew the contractor, and at that point, we decided to open our own facility. So we opened a small facility. We started out in Tennessee, and then we moved to Virginia. So my husband and I and our two young kids actually moved to Virginia when we started our plant in Virginia. We bought an old Wrangler plant. Wrangler was moving to Mexico, and we bought their plant. We bought the equipment, and we started our own production facility. Interesting. And then we got even bigger. We kind of outgrew that. In 2001, one of our prior contractors, who was a public company, their name was Thomaston Mills, they Mm -hmm. ended up going bankrupt. Because in in the 80s, virtually all of the manufacturing for textiles, bedding and apparel moved overseas. Oh. So we bought part of their, some of their equipment, part of their factory out of bankruptcy. And that's the factory that we have today. Before you took over the CEO role, what were you focused on at the company specifically? What part of the business were you running? I pretty much started at the ground up. When Mm -hmm. when I graduated college, after I took that wonderful advice from my my husband, I started basically in the customer service department, handling issues that customers had with orders. And then I moved into the contracts department. And I worked there pretty much most of my career until I became the CEO. I worked with government customers. I managed people that worked on the contracts. And we grew that business a lot. We sold bedding and apparel. We sold items that we made. And we also did distribute other items to those people as well. You took over the CEO role in 2003 after your father retired. What did it feel like to step into his shoes? He was a really good CEO. It was hard. He was still fairly young at that point. You know, he was probably in his 70s, Mm -hmm. I guess, at that point. He still was working. He came to work every day. It was hard for him to kind of step aside. Yeah. 
it took some time to get adjusted how we were going to communicate together. It ended up working out fine. Good. About four years ago, you were ready to step away from the business yourself, but then, you know, a new opportunity caught your attention. Why don't yeah. you give me the short version of how American Blossom Linens came to be? What was the original vision for it? Back in 2018, I guess it was, my daughter got married. She had a baby. I kind of wanted to step back a little bit. I didn't really want to be working as many hours because I wanted to spend some time with my grandchildren. So I was kind of trying to figure out what I was going to do. And at the same time, there was a lot of publicity about Made in USA. The other thing that was kind of growing was the whole direct-to-consumer model. Yeah. And I was thinking, you know, here we have all the ingredients here. You know, we have a factory. They know how to manufacture the product. We don't really have any current retail experience, but, you know, we were in the retail business back in the 1930s and 40s. And I just thought, well, maybe it's time to try to give this a try. Yeah. So we kind of got together as a group, the uh, the management, and we decided we'd give it a try. Yeah. And direct to consumer, you mean just selling sheets and linens straight to the purchaser and not a yeah. B2B operation. Yeah. Yes. Correct. Yeah. And keep in mind, I knew nothing about digital marketing. Nothing. Yeah. <laughs> Our staff knew nothing about it. We had a staff of three IT professionals who ran, we have an Oracle enterprise system that runs mm -hmm. our factory and runs our sales operation, our accounting and all of that. And they're pretty much experts in that. And they really didn't know anything about web development or digital marketing or anything like that. I want to talk about this transition. And, and first, you know, did you expect a big learning curve in this transition from B2B to direct-to-consumer? Or was it more like, you know, hey, we're, we're still selling sheets. How different could it be? Well, I expected a learning curve. I was definitely naive about how certain things worked. <laughs> Specifically, are we talking about digital marketing or, or other things too? I think the process of the manufacturing the sheets, sort of designing the packaging, the shipping, that was all things we were used to. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we ship packages every day. Obviously, we're shipping large boxes and pallets to our institutional customers, but it's still kind of the same thing. But it was the, the marketing, really, that was the thing I had to learn. Tell and, me about that moment where you realized oh my goodness, we don't know everything we need to know. Yeah, so it's pretty funny. I spent a lot of time getting the inventory ready for our launch, getting the packaging done, designing logos, building the website, getting the images together. And I really thought nothing of, well, how's the customer going to find us? Somewhere mm -hmm. in my head, I thought, oh, if you put up a website, people can find you. <laughs> <laughs> takes a little more than that, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I was pretty naive. And so we went live January 1st, 2019. Like 24 hours later, there were no orders. Mm. And I like call up my IT person. I say, there's no orders. Like what happened? And he like laughed at me. He said, well, you haven't done any advertising. How do you expect anyone to find you? I'm like, oh, yeah. <laughs> So how did you go about learning and just wrapping your head around digital marketing? Was it from the internet or from conferences or colleagues? What was that process like? I've always been an avid learner. I always like to read. I like to read business books a lot. I started getting books from the library. I started reading things on the internet. But I, got, I think the biggest thing that helped me, I ended up finding a course online I think I just happened upon it on Facebook called the Social Sales Girls. Mm. And it was really meant for small companies. And they kind of really took you through every step of the way. I mean, she taught you how to log into Facebook, how to create an ads account. It was really kind of simple. I kind of went through her whole course and I learned a lot about it. <laughs> We're talking about things like what social media ads, yes. you know, Google ads, things like that mostly. Yes. 
Yes, yeah. it was mostly uh, Facebook social media ads. Right, okay. So I knew that I didn't really want to do that myself. Mm-hmm. First of all, I don't really have any graphic experience. Sure. And, and I really didn't think my time was spent what would have been spent wisely doing that. Mm-hmm. But I wanted to know enough that I could speak the language and understand when I hired someone else to do it. Yeah. So after I kind of went through that for a bit, I started looking for people to hire to do our Facebook ads. And it actually took me a while, Facebook ads and Google ads. It took me a while to find somebody. I went through like three or four people before I ended up finding the person that now I've been using for two years who's really good. Their name is Just Media, by the way. They're out of Canada. How do you hire the right people when they're experts in something you don't know anything about? There's a good question. (laughs) That's why I felt like it was important for me to learn a bit about it so at least I could understand the lingo. The other thing I always do is I like to hire somebody who's actually done the work a lot themselves. So I ask them questions about, they're not just managing, they are actually doing it themselves. So the person that I hired to do our Facebook ads has his own store that he runs. Mm -hmm. And I like that because he has down-to-earth experience. I also gather references from people and I call their references to see what other customers say. But it's a hard thing to do. Sometimes you just have to go with your gut. <laughs> yeah, it does take some degree of faith, but I, I think there needs to be some vetting process. And Yeah, you know, a couple of the people that I used weren't really responsive. They didn't answer emails. They didn't, I mean, I threw them in. I just, once I hired them and they didn't do that, I said bye after that. I mean, it sounds like you had a pretty positive attitude towards gathering the information you needed, the knowledge you needed to know to launch American Blossom to what it should be. Were there any new tactics that you came across while learning these modern uh, techniques like digital marketing that you were initially resistant to trying? The other thing that we did that I was a little bit resistant in the beginning, I didn't really put this into play until maybe the second or after a year and a half or so. I knew that PR was important too. right? And I had looked into PR and it seemed like It was very hard to trace, to track things with PR. Mm -hmm. Like you can't really, it's hard to track when you spend the money. Are the orders really coming from what you spent the money on? Like in with Google ads and with Facebook, it's really easy to track, but the PR is not so easy to track Mm because I saw other people doing similar things, other people in the space doing similar things. So I started interviewing PR people. And finally, I found someone who seemed knowledgeable and we got along personally. And I thought, okay, it's a lot of money every month, but I'm going to give it a try. And it actually worked out pretty well. Well, I mean, I've seen your TV appearances, so it, it does seem to have worked out pretty well. Let's stay on that for a second because I know PR can be hard to track. Have you been able to track it? Have you seen any sort of impact on customer acquisition, on revenue that you can tie to the PR efforts? There are things that have flopped where we've done something and we've gotten nothing. (laughs) And then there's other things that we've done that we've gotten a lot. I mean, you can see the effect right away. The article goes out or the TV spot was on and then right away, you know, the traffic. And then we also, we try to ask people a lot, how did you find us? And, And they're telling you, hey, it's because I saw you on TV or I saw this YouTube video, right? Yeah, Were there any sales and marketing tactics that you relied on for the old B2B business that just didn't work anymore for American Blossom Linens? Well, the B2B was kind of reactive more. I was very involved in the government side of things, my B2B. I was not, my two cousins and my husband actually, when he worked for the company, were more involved in the healthcare and hospitality side. That side of our business, we uh, run through a distribution network, and we have a sales force that oversees the distribution network. On the government side of things, it's really more reactive. The way the government purchases, they'll send you something. They'll send you an RFQ. They'll say, we want to buy X, Y, Z. And so it was very, as long as you maintain contact with them, they'll send you these uh, requests. So it was kind of 
more reactive than outreach, whereas the healthcare was outreach with a sales force. And I think in the direct-to-consumer, you have to have more outreach. You know, no one's going to know you unless you constantly try to put your face in front of them. But I will tell you kind of the reverse. One of the things that we use in our B2B business that we are definitely using in our direct-to-consumer business is the idea of giving customers the best service possible. I don't know what kind of experience you have when you try to call an online supplier. There are some that are really good, but a lot of them are really bad. I've noticed. You call, there's no answer. You email, they never answer. And that was just, I mean, you don't do that. Our company culture, you answer the phone the first ring. Someone emails you with a question, if you don't have the answer to the question, you answer back anyway. And you say, hey, uh, Mr. So-and-so, I don't have your answer, but I'm going to get back to you in 24 hours. So we're very, very cognizant of that. And we just feel like we need to give the customer really good service. And in fact, a lot of the people in our reviews write about how our service is so good. A lot of personal service and connection. Yeah, that's important. Very important. At this point, did you have any mentors who you could bounce ideas off of specifically when you want to know things about the DTC industry and building a company like that? Did you bring on advisors who are really experts in this kind of business? I will tell you that the PR person that I hired and the digital agency that I hired are kind of those people for me at this point. Mm -hmm. I think... I told you I went through a couple different digital agencies till I found this one. They've been in the business longer than me and they know a lot about it. And I kind of use them for advice. What's the best piece of advice they've given you? I guess they reinforce for me what I kind of already knew, right? Mm. I'll give a good example. So when Facebook changed the algorithm, the whole issue with the Apple phone, we went through a bit of, a period where the ads had to be adjusted. It wasn't working as well. It took a couple, maybe a two months, thinking back, to kind of get things adjusted again because of all of that. And my person said, you know, we're going to get this resolved. We're going to fix it. It's just, you know, a little blip. And I'm a very persistent person. So, I mean, I knew just keep going, keep moving forward. We'll get over this hump. But it's nice to have somebody sort of corroborate that. Yeah. You know, when you're feeling a little bit low or it's just nice to have somebody to say, hey, we're going to get it fixed. It'll be okay. Talked about Facebook ads. We talked about PR. Did you ever test out any other sort of modern business tools or tactics that wound up causing your business more harm than help? I've done some podcast advertising. Mm -hmm. I tried radio. The radio was a complete flop. (laughs) I, I did a lot of investigation, and I ended up picking, believe it or not, I ended up picking a spot in Tennessee, a radio station in Tennessee, because I just thought there'd be a lot of people liking Made in America there. Yeah. And it was a total flop. I think mm-hmm. I didn't get any orders. So there's been mm-hmm. a couple things like that. And I'm, I, again, I'm, I know like a millimeter of information about all of this. I still have a lot more to learn. Certain types of advertising, I'm trying to figure out how to make them work. Mm. I, I'm sure that there's tricks. You just have to learn them. Yeah, but you know you know enough to know when it's not working, right? It, you know, so like, how, how do you make that call? How long do you give a, a new channel or new tactic before you pull the plug? I've done a few podcasts advertising. Some have worked really well. Others have been a flop. I tried to pick similar demographics and podcasts that had the right content. And I still don't know why some are working really well and some are not. We're still fairly small. I want to have an ROI in all my advertising. Mm -hmm, So I I don't give it too long before I decide it's a flop. (laughs) Are there any software tools that have helped American Blossom Linens increase efficiency or just bring in more customers? We're using Shopify. Another kind of little side story. I think I told you that the IT people knew nothing about digital marketing. 
or building a website. I had hired someone to build the website, and then the person just did not follow through. And my IT manager came to me, he said, you know, I'll do it. I'm going to learn how to do it. We're going to use Shop. He investigated kind of the different software. And he said, I'm going to use Shopify, and I'm going to build this for you. And he did. And he's learned all about it. And so he really is the one that kind of runs that part of it. There's a couple of apps we're using for reviews and for pre-ordering. I can't remember all the names of them now. But in terms of logistics and order fulfillment, we're pretty much using our same Oracle system that we use Mm -hmm. for our other business. Learning everything that you have now over the past several years, what advice would you give to other executives when it comes to adopting new tactics and keeping up with current business trends, especially at at well-established businesses? I think you always have to be reading You always have to be reading, whether you're doing it online or you're reading a book, Mm -hmm. and just trying to keep up to date on what's going on. I'll give you a caveat to that. You don't want to do too much of it because you get yourself overwhelmed. I think you have to be very targeted in what you want to learn and kind of try to master a few things because you can't master everything. But I think you have to kind of know what's out there. I think you have to watch what your competitors are doing all the time kind of learn from them. Mm -hmm. I think the most important thing is just when you try something new is being persistent. Don't give up too quick. It's a fine line between when something is a flop and giving up, but not giving up too quick before something materializes. So, and I can't tell you when you make those decisions, but you just kind of, I guess, get a feel for it. But you got to be persistent And, and make sure you, you know, when something's, wrong that you change it. If you could go back to day one of American Blossom Linens, what's one piece of advice you would give yourself that could have saved you a lot of time, money, or effort? Oh, learning about advertising. <laughs> like, wh- wh- why we were building the website? I should have been setting all that up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Hindsight is twenty twenty. And then, yeah. <laughs> And then, like, the whole, I mean, it took the first year sales. They were pretty good. They could have been a lot better if I had known something setting up email marketing. And I sort of let that whole first year go by without, you know, setting it up. Janet, what's the secret to folding a fitted sheet? Oh, I have a video I can send you. It's very hard to kind of describe it. Everybody has a special way, but I have a special way of folding it. I can send it. You could share it with your audience. Please send me the video. I'll make sure to put it in the show notes. I understand it's, it's hard to, to tell and not show when, when it comes to something like that. <laughs> Well, last question. Let's say you're at a party and you want to impress people with a a piece of trivia about linens or the linen business. What nugget do you pull out? Oh, that's easy. Thread count is not what you should use to buy your sheets. What? It's not it. it. And why is that? And what should I be using instead? Well, what you should be using really is you should feel it. You should like the feel yourself when you feel it in the package. You should, in my opinion, stick with natural fibers because things like microfiber sheets, they're very hot, they don't wear very well, and they're terrible for the environment, right? They don't Mm -hmm. disintegrate. (laughs) They stay with us for a very, very long time. You really have to feel for yourself, but thread count is something that's manipulated a lot. In the beginning of the podcast, we were talking about spinning, When you spin a yarn, you can have a a single yarn or you can have a plied yarn. So it's where two or three yarns are kind of twisted together. So generally, a plied yarn is not as good a yarn as a single yarn. It's not as strong. It doesn't make as good quality of fabric. The way people increase the thread count is they ply the yarn So let me step back and talk about what thread count is. So thread count is the number of yarns per square inch. In weaving, there's the vertical yarns and then there's the horizontal yarns. So the vertical yarns is called the warp and the horizontal yarns is called the fill. Hmm. When they check a thread count, you take a square inch and you count the number in the warp and the number in the fill They have like little eyeglasses and pointers that they do this with. 
And that's the thread count, the number that's in the inch. But what happens is when you use a plied yarn, let's just say the thread count to make this easy is 100. 100 of a single ply yarn. But if you ply the yarn to three, it becomes 300. But the plied yarn is really not as good as the single yarn. Mm. So people have this impression that the higher the thread count, the better the fabric. It's really not true. It's just been multiplied through that plying process. Right, and, but they don't tell you that when you look at the package. Uh, of course. It doesn't tell you that it's a plied yarn. It just says the thread count is. That's what it is. When it's a 1,000 thread count, it means it's a plied yarn because there's no weaving equipment that can weave a thread count like that. Well, that's all I've got. Thanks so much for your time, Janet. Oh, thank you, Ben. It was really a pleasure. It's always fun to do these kind of interviews. That was my conversation with Janet Wishnia. Thanks so much to her for being here. Again, I'm Ben Goldstein. I'm the VP of Marketing at Nutshell. Nutshell is a simple and affordable CRM that helps thousands of B2B organizations around the world close more deals. We know if you're a small business owner, there's a point where Google Docs and spreadsheets just don't cut it anymore. That's where we come in. We help B2B organizations of all kinds get off spreadsheets, get organized, and start tracking their contacts and leads. Every Nutshell subscription comes with unlimited contact and data storage and access to our friendly Michigan-based support team starting at just $16 a month. Visit nutshell.com to start a 14-day free trial and use the coupon code POD20 when you purchase to get 20% off your first year subscription. That's all for now. Special thanks to our executive producer, Seth Ressler at Community Marketing Revolution. Thanks to my co-producer, Ashante Clemens. And thank you for listening. Take care. (music) 